Um, so welcome uh, to the first ever webinar hosted by Children of Prisoners Europe, or COPE. So we're very excited about this. Um, so I'm Nancy Laux um, from Families Outside in Scotland, and I'll be chairing the event on behalf of the, the board for COPE. I have the pleasure of being Secretary General to the Board, as well as a visiting professor at the University of Strathclyde uh, Centre for Law, Crime and Justice. And I'm also Chair of INSIP, which is the newly formed International Coalition for Children with Incarcerated Parents. Um, we're currently expecting, as I said, 408 people from 37 different countries, which is fantastic. We've only got about a quarter of those at the moment. Uh, well, 133 I have um, logged in at the minute, but um, we'll ex be expecting people to join in as we go along. Um, a large event like this can obviously come with its difficulties. So if we have a problem with the connection, um, please log in again um, using the original link and password and we'll get things back up and running as soon as possible. Um, we have three speakers for you today. Um, you'll be able to see and hear me and the speakers, but you won't be able to see or hear anyone else taking part. Um, so we encourage you to participate in the event using the, the chat function, which many of you are already doing, which is great. And that's the middle button, the green button at the bottom of your screen. And this allows you to ask questions and make comments throughout um, the event. So each speaker will be speaking for 15 minutes. And then at the end, we'll address all of the questions and comments that have come through. Um, we will be recording uh, the event, so we'll have a, a recording to share at the end as well. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, if you enjoy the event, which I know you will, um, please do consider joining COPE as an affiliate and signing up for the COPE newsletter. Uh, you can do that by emailing contact at networkcope.eu, um, which Brianna will put up in the chat um, just now along with the COPE website, so that information is in the chat screen down at the at the bottom as well. So um, just to get the, the afternoon started, um, as all of you know, the um, COVID-19 pandemic has had a, a particularly negative impact on children and families with someone in prison, both in terms of the worry about the health and welfare of people in custody, and of course the reality that prison visits have been suspended pretty much everywhere. I think Switzerland's the only place that hasn't had visits suspended fully. Um, so that means that maintaining family ties where it's always been difficult, but at the moment, um, this loss of contact has been absolutely devastating. So a tweet from New York earlier this month where they're, um, they've lodged a, a visit codification bill, um, which is being considered to protect the right to in-person visits in future. Um, the tweet said, nothing can replace a hug and a kiss from a parent. Um, so that's the, the reality that we're, that we're talking about here. And, and many jurisdictions have introduced measures um, to release people from prison early, for example, but implementation of that has varied enormously, um, as have the criteria for uh, release. Um, Brianna, I think, might be putting up a, a, a screen share at the moment in relation to the, um, the different, the variation, I suppose, in the numbers of people that have, have been released. And again, we'll put a link up on the, the chat. You can see um, for example, that some people say they've go they're going to release people early, but the reality is very different. So if you look at the difference between England and Wales and France, for example, uh, the numbers of people, the percentages of people who've been released is is minimal um, by comparison. Um, so it's it's trying to merge, I suppose, the realities with um, with the rhetoric. So again, and in, in, as I said, we're, we're down to, um, we're up to 141 people logged in so far. I just wanted to welcome in particular um, the, the Rights of the Child Office at the European Commission and um, Elena Taneva at the Council of Europe, who are longtime supporters of COPE, and we're absolutely delighted that you can, can be here for this. Again, going back to the, what we're, the situation that we're facing, um, the worries that families are facing, um, the, worries that families normally face when someone goes into prison have been um, intensified by the, the pandemic. So the worries that families are facing about the person in prison, about contact, about the increased stress on the family as a result of the pandemic in relation to um, stress, money, worries about employment and the risk of, of abuse for people who are um, enclosed in a, in a house together. All of these have increased exponentially while the support available to deal with these types of issues has, has retracted. Um, a report available shortly from INSIP, from the International Coalition, outlines these, these challenges. 
and Child Rights Connect has recently published a report on how the pandemic has affected the rights of children of parents who are incarcerated. Things like uh, the right to information, the right to family life, the right to health and hygiene, among others. And yet the prison service in England and Wales, for example, has recently confirmed that the, the current regime, this restricted regime, expects to continue for another year and that prison will remain in a restrictive regime after the rest of the country has come out of lockdown. Other countries such as South Korea have not taken that approach and are, are reintroducing visits on a restricted basis, but this again, it's a very slow process. So these are the realities that we need to address in today's webinar um, and beyond. Um, author and activist uh, Arundhati Roy um, states, what she said in, uh, recently was, what COVID does to the body in terms of comorbidity and exposing the weaknesses, it does the same thing to society as well. It enters and it exposes your infirmities, your weaknesses and prejudices and biases. So what does that mean for us in the context of, of prisons and the challenge of keeping children connected to an incarcerated parent? Uh, Rob Allen, a criminal justice researcher and consultant, recently wrote that COVID-19 and the requirements of social distancing are obviously placing great pressure on criminal justice institutions. They've all had to adapt, not only in their ways of working, but also their priorities. If it's true that in the midst of every crisis lies a great opportunity, should some at least of these adaptations form part of a new normal once the pandemic is over? These are the types of questions I really want to, to ask about today. So our speakers today um, are here to share their experience of keeping children connected in this very bizarre new reality. Um, again, they'll each speak for about 15 minutes um, and I encourage you to write any questions and comments using the chat button and we'll revisit those at the end. So again, speakers and then we'll do the questions and discussion at the end. So please do use your chat button. Brianna and I will be keeping tabs on that and hopefully keeping up with you all. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to starting in. Um, so I want to go straight into our first um, speaker. Uh, so our first speaker is Mirna Chacic, who is a COPE member from Roda in Croatia. And they've been dealing with the COVID pandemic alongside an earthquake, so they've had their hands full. Um, so if I can hand over to Myrna. Over to you, Myrna. Uh, first, I want to thank you for having me as a guest. I am very happy to be with you all, and I want to uh, welcome all the uh, panelists and all the guests in this webinar. Uh, I was uh, keeping in mind that um, the time and the concept, so I wanted to uh, present a little bit the work of my organization and then later talk about introduction of video visits as the method that uh, showed to be a crucial part in uh, uh, maintaining the contact between the uh, imprisoned parents and children. And I will finish uh, by uh, saying how these uh, video visits were uh, being one of the greatest uh, st strategies uh, regarding this pandemic situation. So just a second, I want to share the presentation. Uh, so firstly, uh, Roda engaged uh, in the prison system in 2013 after we received uh, one letter from a female prisoner that was asking for a support and that was the first time that uh, we realized that there is actually a need for an NGO to be involved in this kind of field. What happened uh, that time that uh, Roda was using their own parent, uh, parental perspective in implementing different activities and conducting projects and also we were learning a lot from uh, others, <clears throat> from other successful practices from abroad and trying to implement these successful practices in the creation context. Uh, as many of you have maybe uh, faced similar challenges, but uh, when we started to deal in this field, in that time in Croatia, the numbers were showing that there was a reduction in uh, di direct visits. So every year in the prisons, there are less and less children are visiting their own parents. Uh, there was uh, a lot of people who could not afford themselves to go to correctional facilities to visit their in incarcerated parents because many families, they were living in poverty. And also there are a lot of uh, correctional facilities are traffically isolated and also uh, many prisoners are uh, serving time far away from homes. So for the children it's very, very difficult to organize this, uh, these visits in terms of money and in terms of time. 
And also, I think what is very specific for Croatia is that uh, there is a lack of systemic institutional support for children of imprisoned parents. Uh, that means that they can use uh, the services from the state like the rest of the population, but there is no uh, specially conducted and tailored services just specifically for these vulnerable categories. And yes, uh, and considering the prison system, prison system, they always have prisoner as an individual in, the, in their focus. So often uh, they don't uh, have the awareness uh, about the children need while they're visiting their parents. Uh, considering uh, unbroken ties, introduction of video visits, uh, it was a project that started in uh, 2019. Uh, it was uh, based on mutual agreement between UNICEF, Office of Croatia, the Ministry of Justice and uh, Parents in Action RODA as an implementing partner. Uh, RODA was advocating for introduction of video visits uh, as um, successful practices that was already ongoing in other European countries from 2015, but uh, it needed a, a little bit more raising awareness, so they used one opportunity when UNICEF was presenting their own uh, accomplishments in 2017 on the, uh, one meeting and then they raised again this issue. So this is how this agreement happened. Uh, the project itself was based on recommendations uh, of the Committee of Ministers and uh, the emphasis was introduction of video visits and the rest of the, the activities were tailored in order to prevent the risk of reducing direct contacts because we had this hypothesis if we implement video visits that maybe people will uh, be more keen on using video visits instead of directly uh, contacting uh, their parents in prison. So in that terms, we uh, implemented other package of activities that was actually uh, as a certain prevention of this risk. Uh, regarding video visits, uh, they are um, implemented and they are uh, in uh, 13 correctional facilities. In the Republic of Croatia, there is 23 in total. Uh, they are free of charge for the prisoners and families. Uh, they are based on the platform that Ministry of Justice is already using for uh, court proceedings. Uh, they are very um, user friendly, which means that the family receives links and when they click on this link, they are opening the virtual room and they can uh, communicate with the prisoner. Uh, all the spaces that was specifically uh, emphasized in the project recommendations were equipped in a way that they are offering uh, private space and also uh, children cannot see um, uh, judicial officials. It was organized the space in that way that um, it is uh, private and it is not associating anything in the environment considering correctional facility. Uh, the second uh, activity in this project was education of uh, prison staff. Uh, the aim was uh, to raise awareness considering panel teams and uh, judicial officials. Uh, considering children's needs. So we were organizing three sets of education for more than uh, 60 officials. Uh, they, these were covering a great number of topics that were um, considering uh, children needs. It was a uh, legal uh, framework, perspectives and, and obstacles of prisoner in their parental roles. Also, it was communicational trainings that were including how to approach a different uh, age group of children while they're visiting. Uh, also, how to more just um, adjust procedures, security checks and everything in order to reduce the stress of children while entering the correctional facilities. It was uh, important to emphasize that sometimes just a little step and little progress can mean a lot for, uh, for a small child entering in an environment such as a prison. And also since the uh, project was, uh, the beginning was in one uh, correctional facility, we used uh, officials working there to share their, uh, their practices among other officials for the correctional facilities. Uh, the second package was renovation of spaces. Uh, unfortunately, most of the spaces uh, that, uh, that are used for child visitation were uh, organized in a way that um, the corner for children is uh, isolated, so the adult members are sitting on the table and children are playing uh, next to the adult members. So we wanted to um, organize renovation in a way that it will be like, um, like a family atmosphere. And also we uh, put a lot of um, uh, uh, a lot of emphasis on organizing it for different uh, uh, for the children different age uh, because most of the uh, the spaces before this one they had uh, just like toys for the children uh, in early age and nothing for the for the rest of the 
uh, of the kids. The teenagers were maybe more endangered here. Uh, and also, uh, thematic posters were one of the activities when we were uh, photographing exterior and ulterior of uh, spaces in prison. And then we were creating these uh, specific thematic posters uh, with description of daily lives of the prisoners in a child-friendly uh, language. Uh, this was installed in all correctional facilities, uh, in uh, spaces for visitation or, or in awaiting rooms. Uh, the aim was here to uh, talk openly about the prison, to reduce stress uh, with children, uh, open topic with their parents, and also uh, since children in Croatia, they don't have opportunity to uh, go inside of the correctional facilities, and they are not, they don't know how the the spaces look uh, looks. Uh, it was opportunity to see, uh, and so they can imagine uh, the daily life of, of their parents. This was the picture of uh, penitentiary in Lepoglava. This was this awaiting room with these posters. Uh, considering video visits and coronavirus, um, video visits uh, were intensified during the, the, this pandemic situation because uh, in the beginning, uh, the project was intended only for uh, parents prisoners and they could speak with, uh, with their children in the presence of one adult me uh, member of the family. So the rest of the family was not uh, allowed to participate in this visit. Uh, after this uh, coronavirus, Ministry of Justice uh, decided that they will uh, intensify the contacts and they will allow uh, all of the prison population to use this uh, opportunity uh, to talk with their families. I think it was very important because it was basically, uh, apart from telephone contacts and writing letters, the only contact that they uh, had the opportunity to, to maintain during this pandemic situation. Uh, and it was very hard for them because they were uh, prevented from all the contacts outside. And uh, also it was hard because this specific situation was affecting all the so society and they could not uh, perceive it since being isolated. In total, in 2019, we had uh, 308 video calls and in two, uh, 2020, 368 video calls. And uh, it's shown to be very, very, um, useful and I would uh, finish with the feedback from the prisoners. Um, what happened considering video visits during this uh, one year is that uh, we um, saw one a specific benefit of this kind of communication. Uh, there were a certain percentage of prisoners that, that were not visited by their children and uh, more or less some of them were not visited because of um, disturbed parental uh, or partner relationship an, among the family. So what happened in a couple of uh, cases is that uh, adult members did not want to bring a child in, in visiting the in correctional facility, but uh, they uh, allowed a, a child to participate in video visits. So after they again emotionally reattached and reconnect, then uh, other uh, the rest of the family reconsidered about uh, visiting directly. So I think we can conclude that we prevented this main risk considering decreasing the the numbers of direct visits because we wanted to video visits to be um, uh, support in contact, not supplement. And we can say that uh, for now it is a supplement and is an extra contact that prisoners can use and it showed to have a significant uh, emotional dimension of a relationship considering prisoners and uh, uh, and their children. I would like to just read uh, the last one because for me this was emotionally very heartbreaking. A video visit means the whole world to me. Before this video call, I did not see my daughter uh, for 10 years. I think this is a message that um, is showing uh, how important is this kind of services for, for, for one person and for one family. With this, uh, I will finish my presentation. Thanks very much, Mirna. That's fantastic. So we've actually got um, a little bit of extra time, but it'd be helpful, I think, to go ahead and move on to um, the next presentation because, again, it's a, another example of, of um, what other people have done in a similar situation. It's fantastic to hear the progress that you've made in Croatia really very quickly as well. So uh, what I will do is, is go ahead and move on to the, to the second um, speaker. And again, please do continue putting your questions in. Um, because we'll be able to, to address them all at the, at the end. 
Um, so our second speaker is Eduardo Fleischner from COPE, um, uh, COPE member Bambini Sensispare in Italy, and Eduardo is also a member of the board of, of COPE. Um, in Italy, they've been in lockdown a bit longer than, than most of us, um, and despite some significant unrest in, in the beginning, they've done some incredibly positive work to keep uh, children connected to their parents in prison. So, Eduardo, over to you. Hey, thank you very much for having invited me. I want to share the screen now and see if everything is going. Okay, so here we are with the screen. I think it's shared now, is it? Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, I just wanted to say w w w we had it before. Of course, thank you on behalf of Bambini Senza Sbare. Um, thank you on behalf of Bambini Senza Sbare having invited me. Uh, I hope that this is not running too fast. Uh, got some technical problem. Anyway. Thank you very much for everything. But Bini Sensas Bari started in, uh, 18 years ago. We do a lot of things, as you see. Uh, and we do also something that is called the match with that, but this is a long story. And now uh, we switch in a different way because, you know, all the, all the, all the, there is a transition that I don't want to show you and it's uh, annoying. See, we had before, before the COVID-19, uh, we, after many years, we just set up in the last 10 years, I would say, um, what we call yellow space system inside the prison, inside the prison, welcoming area uh, uh, on children tailored, families and children share their problems with our psychologists inside the, the prison, Children meet dad with drawing and talking. Drawing is just a, a tool, a trigger to have a better way to talk. And then children meet with each other, you know, there in the prison because they get to know each other. And children, of course, meet dad with protection of third person in a special uh, talks that we will see later. We have... Uh, mother talks groups. Uh, we have the match with that, but this is another story. And that was inside the prison. And now we had three months outside the prison, outside the prison. And so we decided to set up three different uh, actions, three different tools. One is the yellow phone. The other one is the art workshop. And the, the last one is the neutral space. I will be very, very fast. Okay, yellow telephone was already running hmm, before this COVID era, era but uh, uh, as, as far as the 8th of March, we had uh, all the, 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 the meetings with the parents inside the prison were suspended, were suspended. So we started to say, okay, the, the yellow telephone must be something, uh, we, were, we have to announce the service, increase the service. So put at uh, disposal of everybody. I mean, all the families uh, affected with the, with the, with the uh, imprisoned parents um, for any kind of problem. So we had set up the yellow phone, the yellow telephone. Right? Um, just, of course, for caring for family relationships in, in prison. You know, people, are most, mostly uh, mothers, you know, partners were, are calling, were calling, are calling, and asking kind of psychological support um, just to share their feelings, their frustration, and so forth. And this started to be very useful to them. You know, we have to wait. And so it's very hard to wait and be outside. And the telephone, the yellow telephone, just switched from a, before, you know, was a service where we were saying just, at what hour you, you can get into the prison. Um, by the way, in Italy, there are 
about 200 prisons, 200 prisons, and about more than 100,000 uh, children are affected by imprisoned parents. So these are the figures. Uh, at the very beginning, yellow, uh, yellow telephone was just helping to say, to say just the address of the prison, the, you know, the times where you could get in, at what time to book the, phys the visit. And now it's completely different. Yellow telephone is just a, a, a companion, a partner, somebody who can, you can f call every day and find out what's going on, when they will open the, 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 the prison. And the questions are uh, the usual, what can I say to my children? What, what can I say? Do I say the, the truth? And we always say, you always have to say the truth. The truth is the best thing, you know? And um, in March, we have been reached by 30 families from all around the country. And um, of course, there is a number they can call with the usual mobile cellular network, network or with WhatsApp. Of course, WhatsApp is very, is usually used and they can write emails. Would be very interesting to, to read all the emails and even the, 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 the telephone calls because we, we have a report for every single telephone call. Also because whenever they call again and again and again, it starts to become, you know, to, to, to build up a relationship with the same family, with the same person. And then the other action, of course, uh, we, we, the service was absolutely supported by the, our Italian National Penitentiary Administration Department. We do everything, all our actions in the last 20 years, 18 years, have been coordinated with the Minister of Justice. And um, the, second, the second action is what we have called Art Workshop online. But we call it also a real party, a real party because, um, because it happened something very interesting. Um, we, start, we thought that the yellow telephone could, could, could duplicate itself, become something different. And the difference is something specially suited for, for the children. Because with the telephone, the yellow telephone, mostly where the mothers and the partners and the relatives calling, are calling still now, of course. And we started to think that we need to do something just for the children. So we, we, we just set up this art workshop hmm, online. I would say it has been very successful, very successful. Of course, we have been, we are using drawings, you know, to draw and to paint as usual, because we do, we, we, we have been doing this for years. We, we will do this again in prison. It, drawing, you know, perfectly, because many of, of us do the same in their, in their countries. This, this drawing is a, is a tool, is a trigger, is a formidable trigger to encourage children, you know, to chat with their dads or mothers. We, I saw with my eyes so many times, you know, at the very beginning, the, the real dif the difficulties of talking, you know, the children um, is with his father or her father inside an ugly place. So there's, there's some, you need something to, to to get closer and drawings are often the way they start to draw something and then the father says what is this this is my school ah what's happening in the school how are your friends and then the talk is starting there always as a trigger is never an aim of course and we did about, about the same here of course the 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 dads uh, the the fathers were not there because it's not allowed yet to do something like this but um, was uh, you know it was cooling the frost the frustration it was very I would say it's very um, interesting um, see this strange this strange time was seen also a kind of as a 
kind of party, one of the, of the mother told us, but this is a festa, this is a festa, this is a party. And we said, oh yes, it's a party. And so we call it art party and he's, and he's, and he's working. It's going very well, it's going very well. And uh, the drawings are often drawing absolutely of, you know, fantasy or specifically about somewhere they want to go. Uh, I remember the last one, the last uh, art party, there was a mother saying to um, a daughter, where do you want to go? Where would you like to go with dad? And uh, she drew a, a, a seaside, water, just a, some water. And another guy was connected and he's on the Lake of Como. Right? So he, he, he has the lake in front of his window, said, I don't need the, the seaside, I got the lake. And so he drew the lake. And they started to talk about the better the seaside, better the lake, or whenever my dad is going to go out, I will come to the lake and so forth. A real festa, a real party. And then the third action we did is this, what is called neutral space. Um, this is for, you know, when you have uh, in prison, and now it's difficult to duplicate this situation, um, a meeting with, with the family who has a conflict inside the family, maybe they are divorced or, or the, uh, you know, the mother doesn't want uh, to go and visit uh, uh, the father with his uh, child. So complicated situation. In this case, usually you have in, it, in the Italian prison a special meeting with the prisoner, the child, and a third person sitting there watching and listening everything, ready to intervene if it is necessary we duplicate exactly the same situation uh, on the video chat, which is not easy. Uh, of course, the situation is tense, so it's not easy to do. But I, I, could, I could not, uh, you know, uh, be there, of course, because they are very private situation. But the thing is, we have the child, the detained parent, a professional from Bambini Senses Barre who is there uh, participating, ready to intervene, and sometimes even a prison officer. All this is done on video chat, on video chat, you know? And last April the 1st, something happened that we liked a lot and we want to duplicate now when the, when the prison will be open. You know, a child took his smartphone and turned it towards his room. And so the father said, oh, that's your room? Oh yeah, I, I never saw it before. I never saw it before. And so the child did this. I don't know if it is allowed or not, but he did it. So <laughs> that's it. Uh, it was a, was a wonderful moment. So what after? COVID-19, we would like to, we would like to bring, uh, you know, to, 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 to do the same things that we were doing now, uh, we are outside, we will, we will like transfer the same things together with the usual visits inside the prison. So we want to go on with the yellow, to yellow telephone, of course, supporting the families, we meet the families every day, all the year long, every day. We know that we get to know all these families, thousands of them, and we follow them. But, you know, if they have a, another mean to get in contact, to talk, which is the yellow telephone, will be the telephone, the yellow telephone, maybe this is even uh, a, a greater support. Then we want to organize the children talk group, which is a kind of festa, art is, is not an art party, it will be the children party, um, which is not possible inside the prison, just some two or three times a year, but not every day, maybe every week or something. 
And then the other thing is that we want to, to like, to, to, to say to everybody, also to you all that you are listening, and uh, see, we don't want all these video meeting, uh, parties, you know, uh, occasions to, 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 to be near, uh, just the parentheses here during the, 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 the COVID era, the COVID period. We want to add to the physical meetings that the prisoners have the right to have inside the prison whenever they will be able to do it again, whenever it will be allowed again, that could be in July or August or September, who knows? Uh, <laughs> keep in touch and I will tell you. Um, and we would like to add to these visits, physical visits, also all the, these other occasions. It's not that uh, one hour special vision or, uh, or issue. It's just an, an issue written in the charter of the rights uh, of the child's of uh, imprisoned parents, the Italian charter, and it's written in the Council of Europe recommendation that Mina orated, uh, um, quoted. So it's something that is written in very important charters. One is the Italian one. You know, we started in 1914, uh, 2014 to have the first chart signed. And now it is written in the recommendation. And we want to say to those people, uh, you know, now don't do that. Don't say that the video chat is enough. So the physical meetings, well, maybe they could be even less than usual. Don't do that. Don't do that. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful, thanks very much, Eduardo. We've got lots and lots of questions coming in, which is fantastic. I'm hoping I can keep up with them. Um, again, we will get to them at the, at the end of the conversation, but I do want to um, finish uh, to kind of wrap things up with our third speaker. Um, our last speaker is Richard Garside um, from England. And Richard is the director of the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies in London and senior visiting research fellow at the Open University. And prior to joining the centre, Richard worked at uh, the NGO NACRO as Head of Communications. So I will hand over to Richard. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy, and, uh, and thank you uh, uh, both to Myrna and Eduardo for some really interesting presentations, which kind of, I think it was, it's really kind of struck me just from listening to both of you, the, the acute dilemmas, actually, of trying to kind of make prison livable. For, for young people uh, in relation to their contact with families in what is a very, very difficult period. Uh, and it's very difficult for those children and young people in custody, of course, and it's also very diff um, difficult for, for their families. And certainly at the centre, we get, um, we get emails and letters, including from families who are sick to death, really, really worried about the welfare of their children, um, worried about what's happening to them, whether they're just even really mundane and basic stuff. Are they getting enough to eat? Um, is anybody looking out for them if they fall sick? Uh, and there's a huge amount of anxiety uh, in the current situation, which um, certainly uh, from the UK perspective, I'd say the government, and of course there are three different criminal justice jurisdictions in the UK, in England and Wales, in Scotland and in Northern Ireland. Um, I don't think really any of those jurisdictions are doing a very good job at really thinking through these issues and how to respond. Um, uh, just to kind of give you an indication or sense of, of kind of a starting point for, for thinking about these issues, um, I just want to kind of share this, um, this thread from Twitter. Um, it's a thread that I put up. I'm not trying to be self-serving or anything. It's just that it, I put it all up in one place and I thought it was uh, relevant for this discussion. Um, so this is a list of, of some relatively recent incidents in, in youth um, jails uh, in England and Wales involving young people who've died or had very, very um, damaging outcomes. So I'll just start. I won't read all of them in detail. But we can hear this is um, a boy called Gareth Myatt, um, who was held down by officers 
Um, they just, the officers dismissed his cries that he couldn't breathe. He lost consciousness and was pronounced dead on arrival in hospital. Joseph Scholes um, begged his mother to get him transferred to a children's home. Um, I actually met Joseph's mother several times to talk about his case, and it's a particularly tragic and very sad case, this one. Um, before he'd taken his life, Joseph, just one month after his 16th birthday, wrote to his parents saying, I'm sorry, I just can't cope. Mm -hmm. um, a 15-year-old girl in Medway Secure Training Centre, uh, the euphemism makes it sound like it's about training, it is a children's prison. Uh, it's actually now been closed because it's been so notorious. Um, a 15 year old girl who miscarried alone in her cell. Uh, officers dismissed her request to be taken to hospital. Uh, all they did was come into her cell and hand her some sanitary tiles and tell her to go to sleep. Jay Cardi, um, a boy with ADHD, um, it's an attention deficit uh, disorder, who faced huge and horrific bullying in custody, um, wrote to his mother, if you're reading this, it's because I'm not alive. I couldn't cope. People giving me shit, even the staff. Um, the independent, there's an inquiry at the moment going on um, in the UK, independent inquiry into child sexual abuse. And it's looking particularly at sexual abuse and other forms of abuse in institutional settings. And in their, one of their re more recent reports, they reported on a crying boy, this is in custody, being restrained by four members of staff squatting behind him, thrusting his hips towards the boy. Another thing from the same report, a child's wrist was said to snap like a pencil during restraint. These are restraint techniques which are formally allowed by the British government. These are not rogue restraint techniques here. His wrist said to snap like a pencil during restraint. Despite his continuing screams, officers forced his arms into a wrist lock position behind his back. He was left in his cell crying and in agony. 14-year-old Adam Rickwood hanged himself with his trainer laces in August 2004. So this is some years ago now, but very little has changed in the intervening years. Hanged himself with his trainer laces after being inflicted with nose distraction, uh, which, um, you know, is a nice sounding term. It's basically a punch in the face by a prison officer. Again, a, 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 a technique that's only recently been banned. Um, so a number of cases here. Um, the reason for kind of sharing those from the outset is to remind ourselves that um, prisons um, and the youth custodial system, youth prisons, were in, certainly in the UK, um, were in a very dreadful state before the coronavirus problems hit. Uh, and they've only got worse since. Um, there are no really formal inspections at the moment in, in prisons, so we don't even have any independent verification of what's going on in them. Um, we have to conclude that there is, uh, you know, a, a fair amount of abuse at various points, but we just simply don't know that. And we know that many prisoners are alone for many, many hours in their cells, um, hungry, tired, cold and frightened. Um, what I want to do now is just broaden this out and just think a little bit about how this might look from a European level. And we've been working on a project with a number of European partners just trying to gather information about the situation in relation to coronavirus and prisons. And let me just share you a few slides just to give you an idea of the kind of work we've been doing. Um, so this is one of our recent infographics that we've put together. It's on coronavirus in prisons in Spain. Uh, we have a number of infographics for different jurisdictions on our website. If you want to find them, you can just go onto our website and just click on this and any of these um, things and then the uh, the, the tab here will, will give you access to all of them. So this is just a kind of a, a snapshot of the situation in Spain um, as of a few weeks ago. Um, these things move very quickly. And one of the things I wanted to say, I'm really conscious that we have um, a, a truly international uh, and pan-European um, audience here. So if you think you have any information about these situations you want to share with us, please do get in touch. And including if you think we've got anything wrong. Uh, if you think that there are some things we need to correct on our website in terms of data or information, uh, then please um, do get in touch. Um, here's, a, here's another slide. Uh, Nancy um, showed a little bit of it earlier. Um, and it shows the changes in the prison populations across a number of European countries since the outbreak of coronavirus. So in France, it's dropped by 14% through a combination of courts slowing down 
uh, fewer people coming to court, uh, and also action by the French government to reduce and remove people from the custodial system. Italy down by 10%. Um, it may be that Eduardo is in a position to give a, a clearer sense of, um, of, of what, what will happen there. Belgium 9%, England and Wales 2%, uh, far behind. Um, and then this is the proportion of prisoners who's been, been let out specifically from coronavirus related um, actions. Um, Cyprus, 17%, the pro um, proportion of prisoners let out under those schemes. Again, we can go down. England and Wales, virtually nothing. It, this, uh, in England and Wales, uh, there was an announcement some months, a few months ago, suggesting that up to 4,000 prisoners would be released under an early release scheme. Uh, so far, it's less than 100. Um, Scotland is, I think, proportionately doing maybe slightly better, but Nancy may be able to correct me on that. No, I thought maybe not then from, from what Nancy's checking it. Uh, Northern Ireland proportionately doing slightly better, but they have a much smaller prison system. And again, just another way of just summarising the data, looking at different kind of um, approaches to, um, uh, to, to, to getting people out of prison. And then finally, just another quick infographic. These are a summary of some you know, different jurisdictions and the steps that are being taken um, to try to prevent um, prisons being overburdened at a time like this. So, you know, postponing sentences, which is a common feature across a number of jurisdictions at the moment, um, or moving sent prison sentences into community sentences, that's another, uh, that's another kind of thing that's being done. Uh, and again, um, another, another infographic, you can have a look there. Um, we're going to continue to pull all of this information together. The data we're collating will also be age related, so we will be collating information on under 18s, uh, and we'll be continuing to produce um, comparative reports, uh, looking at the different jurisdictions and how they're working. And one of the main reasons that we're doing this work is that we're trying to, I mean, you know, we have, we have great concerns about what's happening across uh, not just the UK prison system, but across non European prison systems. But we're also trying to be constructive and helpful, trying to kind of identify areas of better practice that um, prison administrators can can implement uh, to to try to control the spread and to make prisons uh, at least livable for um, for prisoners. Um, another initiative um, that we're also involved in, I'll just quickly share the screen on this. Some of you may be familiar with this, the work of this organisation, the European Prison Observatory. Uh, we're the UK partner of that and the Prison Observatory is also producing fairly regular reports uh, looking across Europe what's happening. They're kind of rather in the form of snapshot. You can see the most recent one just out actually um, today in fact and you know you can kind of see if you if you want to have a look at that. Um, they have kind of short country summaries um, of the situation. Some of them more, um, more um, kind of um, extensive than others. Uh, you can see here the one on Romania is actually um, fairly extensive comparatively. Um, but again, um, you, can, you can find that on, on the European Prison Observatory website. That's just prisonobservatory.org. And again, if, you, if you're a country specialist and you identify any mistakes in those reports, then, then do get in touch and, uh, and let the Prison Observatory know. It's key, they're keen to um, um, keep them updated. Okay, so that's the kind of the sort of the situation if, if, if we look at it as from a kind of, as, it were, as, as from a helicopter, you know, from above and trying to kind of look at the, the general picture. Um, I just want to say a few words now and then I'll finish just kind of thinking about um, the way forward. Um, and I want to start with um, a comment, um, if I can find it, here we are. Um, a comment that was, it was in, this was in a newspaper in, 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 in the UK a few, last week in fact, and this is what the author said, prisoners are, prisons are still in the early stages of dealing with this disease. And I just said, quoting someone called Charlie Allen, who wrote a piece, and this is what he said, the whole estate, so he's talking about basically the prison estate in England and Wales, the whole estate remains a tinderbox. And while the outside world rightly focuses on preventing a devastating second or even third wave of infections later in the year, prisons are still climbing their first peak. Um, and I think this is a really important point to bear in mind that actually, uh, you know, prisons have actually to date, certainly in the UK, relatively speaking, we've had far fewer deaths from coronavirus and far fewer infections from coronavirus um, than we would have expected or feared. 
Um, it's difficult to know what's happening in the youth estate. The information is being collected on the youth estate in England, in the UK, or in England and Wales, uh, but it's not being um, published in any kind of meaningful sense. It's very difficult to know exactly what's happening in the youth estate. So all we can do is talk about the generality of prisons and the situation is, is, is pretty grim, but it could be a lot worse. It could be a lot worse than it is. The way that um, the government and the prison authorities have managed to prevent it being much, grim, much worse than it could have been is basically by instituting solitary confinement. So prisoners are being kept in their cells, including children and young people, I hasten to add, in their cells for 23, 23 and a half hours out of every 24. Um, let out only for very short periods of time, possibly to make a phone call, maybe to have a shower if they're lucky, uh, and then put back in their cells. Um, so it's a form of a lockdown uh, in prisons, uh, which has been, broadly speaking, effective in containing what could have been a much worse spread of, of coronavirus in prisons in the UK. Um, but this can't go on forever, or can it? The, the real concern now, and I think it's particularly a question about in relation to young people, of course, um, but it's true of, of prisoners of all age. Um, you know, we're facing a situation where the, uh, the British prison system could affect, and I'm sure this is probably true of a number of the European jurisdictions, the British prison system is effectively kept in lockdown for months, possibly even years. Uh, and that's a great concern to me and my colleagues um, at the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies. And um, one of the things that we're pressing very hard, and we're not the only one saying this, is that we really need to actually see far fewer people in prison uh, in order to um, ensure enough social distancing, whilst also having a manageable prison regime which doesn't drive people mad uh, and have some long-term damage to, to many people. So one of the things, for example, that we are doing is uh, we're working as, as part of a coalition of organisations in the UK calling effectively for children in custody to be, um, to be released from prison now. Uh, I mean, this was, uh, you can see this was back in March. Uh, nothing has really changed since then. Um, but we were calling for uh, basically virtually all young people uh, to be released from custody, sent back home. Uh, there are always going to be some a few cases where that's not going to be practical or possible for a range of reasons, uh, but nonetheless, um, we, that's what we were calling for. No sign the government are taking this seriously at all at the moment. So my, my concern is, um, I mean, on the one hand, um, we're probably in a better position than we otherwise would have been. The, the youth prison population in England and Wales is currently under 1,000, which is still a lot, uh, but 10 years ago it was over 3,000. So we've seen a significant reduction in the youth custodial population, not because we had progressive governments that wanted to reduce the number of young people in custody, uh, but because we had quite significant cuts to policing, amongst other things, uh, which meant that there weren't as many police around arresting young people and uh, introducing them into the criminal justice system and into prosecution and criminalisation. So that's been the gain. Uh, only a third of the young people currently facing the situation, and that would have been the case if coronavirus had, had started 10 years ago. Uh, but we would certainly like to, uh, to, to see a lot more work done on this. Uh, and we do think that um, despite the very difficult difficult situation that many, many people, including prisoners um, and wider society are facing, uh, the, the coronavirus crisis does present an opportunity to rethink some of our basic assumptions about who should be in prison um, and for how long and in what conditions can they be held. I suspect it will take quite a while before that thinking if it ever develops to work through and it will work through in different jurisdictions across Europe and the world in different ways. But I do think there's an opportunity there for us to um, engage in a dialogue which in the longer run might lead to far fewer people being held in prison. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that Richard. It's a very powerful <laughs> uh, reminder of what this all means to people um, when, when they're in, in prison as well as to, to the people outside. Uh, we do have lots and lots of questions so I don't want to um, spend been too long um, wrapping away um, but what I would ask is I mean I still haven't actually got through I think I've got I've got 15 questions left to get through um, so what I'll do is I'll ask a few questions and I'd ask that you keep your responses fairly brief if you can um, some of them are very uh, straightforward um, kind of logistical questions and other than others you'll be able to go into a bit more more depth um, 
But can I just go ahead and start by asking from um, Bente Grambo in Norway, um, do any of you know if there are countries in Europe who have the principle of no physical contact um, during visits as a norm? Uh, and if so, how are they managing that in a child-friendly manner? I don't know if any of you have answers to that. You might want to unmute yourselves just so you don't have to keep muting and unmuting. That's something any of you aware of? I mean, if, if um, it might be worth getting in touch with the um, European Prison Observatory, uh, because it is a, a coalition of organisations made up of country specialists. Um, so I don't know the answer myself. Um, I, I'm interested in the answer, whether that is the case, um, but it could well be that um, one or other member of the European Prison Observatory might, might know. Brianna, I'm going to drag you in. Is that something that COPE is aware of at all? Yeah, Brianna's muted, so she's trying to be anonymous. Um, not off the top of my head, no. I, not, I don't have any firm information on that. Right. Okay, so we'll see if we can find out a bit more. That would be really helpful. Um, a lot of the questions initially, I'm going, kind of going in order here, so a lot of the first ones are directed at, at Myrna. Um, Sarah Higgins from the UK asks if you can share the, the training for um, prison officials. Um, is it something they'd like to develop in their prison in England? The question is if I want to share the content again. Uh -huh. the, the, tra the, the training that you're planning to deliver to prison staff, to, to officials. Uh, the prison staff, uh, the trainings were organized in three rounds. Uh, the, the important thing was to gather uh, members of panel teams and members of judicial police, all of them that uh, got into contact with children during visitation. So we wanted to uh, cover as much as uh, areas possible that we found that, that are crucial to prevent all these risks. So basically it was uh, based on the, um, uh, on the legal framework one part in order how to, um, how to uh, more approach these international uh, recommendations and regulations to a everyday level, which means how to uh, estimate a child best interest from your own working perspective. We wanted to have uh, to send the idea that every prisoner for himself need to have this idea how to protect uh, best the child from their own perspective. Also, it was a communication training considering how to uh, adjust to children's needs. And this was uh, specifically important for the children who are uh, during the visitation, especially for security checks, for, for uh, taking documentation and uh, how to behave during the visitations in order to children feel more safe and more protected and to reducing this level of stress with, while they're entering. It was very important. And of course, sharing best practices uh, among the system itself, because some of them, they already had experiences of introducing video visits and some of them were brand new in this. A bigger question was whether that's something that would be available for other people to use in, in future as well, whether that training that you've delivered might be uh, available to, to others. Um, so that's something we can talk about after, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Um, another question for you, Mirna. In Croatia, can more than one virtual visit happen at the same time? This is from Rachel Brett. Uh, it is possible. There is more the virtual rooms, uh, but the point is that uh, when prisoner uh, want to uh, engage in a video visitation, family and the prisoner they need to fill a little bit of paperwork, and then they are scheduled in the exact date. Uh, and this is all organized before, so uh, yeah, of course it's possible because uh, a lot of correctional facilities is using it, but I, yeah, they are scheduling it. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm running through these very quickly, I realize, but there are lots of questions, a lot of really good ones. Uh, Freya Hilfe in Berlin um, said, Merna, that you mentioned the video visits are free of charge. Um, what about families that have no access to the technical facilities? Is there any financial help for them? Uh, well, we were also considering this while planning uh, uh, planning uh, our activities. Um, it is very simple to uh, to use it. So uh, we were thinking if somebody doesn't have access to internet or to devices, that we can support um, support them by um, by other NGOs and facilities, so they can go there and, and organize the visit. But for now, I must say that we didn't have uh, this kind of requests. Uh, I don't know if it's simply people in Croatia all possess mobile or some kind of devices and for them uh, it was not difficult to, to access. 
and to organize this. The families were uh, were actually very interested, and they were uh, they didn't have any technical problems considering considering devices and considering connection. Thanks. That's one of the issues we're facing in Scotland at the moment. Is it's not difficult, but often they might not have access to free Wi-Fi or enough data on their phones to to connect for video visits. Mm -hmm. That's something that's that we're looking at at the moment. Um, do the children connect from wherever they want during the video visit? Uh, the project as a pilot was exclusively prisoners and uh, ch their minor children and one adult member as a guardian because children always need to come with one, one adult member. Uh, and uh, the rest of the family was not allowed to participate in visitation. I know that they had intention to expand the project activities in the future, but this, uh, I would say that this situation with coronavirus a little bit facilitated and uh, speed up things because now they, uh, they, it's allowed for everybody, for foreign prisoners, for pretrial detainees. Uh, we will see what will happen in the future, but I know that their intention was to, uh, to expand it to, uh, to the rest of the families. Thanks very much. Um, and then a final question for you, Marina, from Lucy Gamble, our COPE president, um, said question for you about the photo displays in the visits waiting areas and the visits room. In mm -hmm. many countries, children are not told the truth. They're told lies about where their mm -hmm. parent is and therefore, in theory, don't know where they are or don't know that they are in prison. Um, so Lucy was interested in knowing if this has been raised as a problem um, within your own work. And Eduardo, that might be helpful for you to answer as, as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was actually uh, on these trainings that I were mentioning before, we had a lot of interactive work and uh, uh, the prison officials were mentioning that for them it's very difficult and challenging to work with prisoners and support them in their parental role if they did not tell the truth to the children. And uh, most of them, they are feeling uh, ashamed and they are lying, they are telling that they are working abroad uh, instead of the truth. So we were... Um, doing uh, some booklets and some written materials and uh, posters and flyers also uh, to um, to encourage them to tell the truth and also the video visits uh, are organized in that way so that the child cannot recognize from where the parent is calling uh, this was also very important for for the, the so the people or if they did not tell the truth can also use it this was that's why the recommendations were were very specific and uh, and I must say that they were respecting it while organizing the space. Eduardo, was that an issue that your work has had to address also? You mean the lying? Where the? Yeah, um, I, I don't want to be ironic, but uh, you know, your dad is away. It's very difficult to say your dad is away and that the mother goes to the prison and has to, you know, say I'm going shopping and instead he's going, she's going to the prison. Now it's very easy. Uh, daddy, dad is away, he's working away, uh, he cannot come back. So now it's very easy. Sorry, but it's like this. <laughs> so through the, the video visits you can, can make that yeah. excuse, I suppose? Yeah. No, no, there's no c'è militare davanti quando c'è. There's no police uh, when you make the, 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 the video chat. There's no police. So you could be wherever, you know, uh, somewhere, <laughs> not specifically where. It, it's awful because it's, it's a lie. We all, we have been doing, we all, uh, you know, all the members of COPE, all the people are working in prison know perfectly that the, you you should not you should never lie you know daddy is in prison but we know that this is a very difficult issue very uh, you know very difficult issue we have been doing we have been knowing this for a long time and how to it make the, pet, the parent or the carer at home feel confident to tell the child the truth and how to do that that's an ongoing question for all of us i think um, again, a question for both Mirna and Eduardo. I promise I will have some questions for you as well, Richard. Um, but uh, Lucy from uh, CUNO, from the Quaker UN office, asks, um, what do you expect uh, will happen with video visits after COVID? Do you think the expansion of, of this of video visits will be a permanent change? Uh, I know that they had intention to expand it on, the, on more categories. I don't know uh, in what extension it will be, but I guess it will be more, more, uh, more categories than in the pilot. 
Yes, in Italy, absolutely, they will increase a lot. As I was saying, they must not substitute the physical uh, mm. meetings. They must not. They have to be more, not less. It's one of something that a colleague at the Scottish Prison Service described as a corona bonus. There's something positive that comes out that will hopefully stay on after uh, the COVID is, is, is over. Um, trying to have additional ways of, of maintaining that, that contact. Um, similar question from Athena Dimitru in Cyprus, um, but she was saying um, she was interested in the physical contact of children with imprisoned parents in their prisons. They did many things to maintain connection um, for the sake of healthy relationships between the two people. Um, for example, they've extended unlimited access to phone calls. Um, however, the um, the measures outside prisons have been removed and they're wanting to know how to maintain healthy relationships. Um, trying to work out what the actual question is. Um, she's unsure what the best thing is to do about physical contact. For now, they're having visits with a, a glass partition um, between, but they don't know how long that can last. I think Switzerland's done the same thing where they have, they're continuing visits, but with glass. Um, so they're wondering how to reintroduce, I suppose, um, that, that physical contact. Is that something you've been able to think about at all? So no for Eduardo. Mirna, is that something you've had a chance to look at at all? I think it will. It, it will. It, it's an open question for the future, but now it's um, it's very hard to estimate what will happen. Eduardo. Um, in Italy, we are monitoring the situation because some are proposing this, so we are trying to understand where they do it. Maybe. And if it is working, it's going to, to become a good way to, to, to start to just open the, the, the doors of the, the prisons. Again, for um, both of you, um, from Clementine Manning, um, she's asking what support um, you offer for children and young people and their families outside of prison. Her role is based in the community and they don't work directly with people in prison, but just with the families. Um, so they're just wondering what um, types of services you have available in the community. Uh, we in Rhoda, we were in one part of our activities dedicated to people who are uh, currently in correctional facilities by boosting the ways of communication. But also now, uh, our latest activities were uh, we are focusing uh, also on the process of uh, resocialization. We have one project when we were um gathering and building together with uh, the rest of the ngos in croatia a platform that will have a website and we are creating uh content that will be um helpful for the people who are in the process of um rebuilding their lives it was also a uh, initiative in order to um, raise the network and exchange information to see in what kind of fields we need the more support and to see who is working what because a lot of NGOs were having similar activities that they were not aware of each other. So this would be like a, a, a very nice way to exchange the information and to also uh, get, receive direct feedback from the beneficiaries themselves and to be able to support them in a better way. Eduardo, in terms of support you offer to families in the community? Yes. Uh, I was just exposing that, you know, the three other actions we have now are just for the community, for the community of the families and large families also. You know, everybody's calling us, <laughs> everybody, not only the mother, you know, not only the, 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 the wife or, uh, or the whole family and the families are very really large in this moment. Even if they're closed up, they. Every, everybody's calling. So the, the working on in the community is this, the only one we can do now. Okay, um, a few practical questions about the, the yellow telephone. Um, so from Judith Feige in uh, the German National Human Rights Institution, she's asking if children can use the yellow telephone to call their parents in custody. They cannot call by themselves, by themselves alone, not now. So the mother or the care, the carer is, you know, showing uh, to the to the, the camera the ID, 
just to make to be recognized and then she can have the the, the children the two children uh, or whatever but they cannot by themselves by themselves fino a 14 anni is that right until 14 years old yeah when they are from you know from 14 years old then older they can do it not before but they can ring in yeah right. no they can call by themselves yes okay. which is different you know by alone by themselves mm -hmm. they can pick up the phone of mm -hmm. course they have to set up the the, the conversation mm -hmm. but the book the conversation otherwise nobody's answering and it's a matter of fact that the conversation starts from the prison to the child and not vice versa right vice versa okay got it um, question from Marcus Drechsler. Um, Richard, you might be able to help with this one as well. Do you know of other countries that have something similar to the yellow telephone? No, we don't know. We imagine yes, mm -hmm. because it's a very simple, very simple action, very simple thing to organize. Of course, we need many people. Uh, one thing could be very interesting. We record, we we just record all the the, the telephone all the, the the calls so who's calling what they are saying and everything so we have a database now a huge database with all these calls and it's very interesting not only for statistics but also for you know catch you know to to find out without the main issues maybe three months ago there were some some of them and now they've changed because mm -hmm. things are changing so it's very useful to do to make curves <laughs> the curves are very important this time this time and and richard are you aware of any other countries that do that sort of thing um no i'm sorry i'm not and i suspect that if um, eduardo doesn't uh doesn't know the answer to that i would um i'm unlikely to <laughs> yeah that's, that's helpful thank you um Another question for Eduardo. Did you have questions from families about um, security over the video, uh, basically showing their children online during these, the, the art parties? Was that a concern at all? See, it's a private conversation. If you mean the art parties, what we call the art parties, it's a private conversation. You know, the pictures that I showed, that you couldn't recognize the, ch the children, you know? The, we take a lot of pictures. Some of the times we record, like we are doing now, the whole session, but it's just for us to study the situation, to understand better the family and so forth. So we don't need to have them sign something that, say, that says you can show the, 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 our conversation. It's absolutely private. Even in large, because maybe there are two, three, four families, the party is growing up. Um, I tell you, it's growing up. At the very beginning, it was only one family, then two, and so forth. But they they know that all the Im images are private. They all everything we say is private, absolutely. Yeah. So um, that leads very nicely to the next question from our children in New York, it's asking how many children can join at a time, how many children at a time take part in the, uh, in the art party. Uh, you know, if you have, for example, the last time there were two families, if I remember well, two, uh, one with one child and another one with two girls, if I remember well, and, and so we are, you know, we are um, fixing, we are just establishing no more than four. This is just one, one parameter. We will see, we will check, maybe even more. It depends. You know, every single time we have to then have a meeting, understand what was wrong, what was good, what we can improve and what not. Thank you very much. Um, and one last question actually from Ebru Aktan Akar in Turkey. Um, why did you call the color yellow? Why, why yellow space in yellow telephone? <laughs> yes, everybody. You know, we have yellow space, and the yellow space was because we need we needed to put some sun inside the prison. So we started 
in, uh, we started in 2013, 20, 20, 27 <clears throat> in uh, San Vittorio prison in Milan. And when we un understood that there was no place for the children to wait for them, for their meeting with their dads, uh, we, we started to fight. The, the, the very beginning was a kind of fighting to have this area. And when we obtained the area, very small at the very beginning from the prison, we said, mm, this should be a sunshining place. And said, that, and then uh, everything is yellow now in, in Bambini San Sasbare. It started with the yellow space, and then the yellow sp uh, space system, and then the yellow phone. Uh, you, you will see the, there will be more yellow things in the future. Excellent, thank you. Um, this is a comment from Evelina Startek in Poland, um, but Richard, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this in particular. Um, she said that Poland has had Skype calls since 2014. Um, they were limited depending on the prison regime and available for families when people lived far away. But since COVID, the use of Skype has been expanded and it's available to, to everybody. Um, but she works with children with a parent in prison and recently a 12-year-old girl commented that um, now it's actually harder for her to see her mum because when she sees her mum, she wants to cuddle her mum. And so she actually wants the option to speak on telephone instead of a video visit. So it kind of talks about the, the ethics and the real personal impact of, of this video contact. I'm just interested in your, in your thoughts on that. No, I think that is a real, um, and again, it was a real issue before, um, before the current lockdown. Um, you know, one of the kind of, quite positive things that was done in, in the UK through the sort of, well, I suppose the 90s in particular, which were the 80s, was a, an investment in, in family centres, family visit centres, uh, and trying to make it easier for families to visit um, prisons, and including, obviously, um, crucial children. Um, and, you know, that was always a, uh, you know, a kind of bittersweet experience for, for many people anyway. And um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't surprise me. I think one of my concerns really about the whole video visit um, module, and we've, we've seen this in other developments and innovations in the prison system. They have a kind of a way of sticking around after the immediate um, kind of immediate demand is is is, is being reduced. And you know, in in the basis that you know we're going to see probably coronavirus endemic um, in society for potentially many years. Actually, I mean, it's not. A, I mean, I'm not a virologist, but as I understand it, it's not even clear at this point whether we'll be able to develop an effective vaccine. Um, and I think that places an enormous um, dilemma for, for the prison system. I think there's some, you know, I'm doing some great work in the short term trying to ensure that prisoners and their families can stay in touch is, is really important. Um, but it's, it's really important it doesn't become the new normal. Um, you know, because we can see how that could go. I mean, it could be very, certainly very appealing to prison administrators, because rather than having to pay what is you know the poultry travel grants whatever that prisoners families can sometimes get to visit prisoners and just the cost and the time involved in getting someone through the gate searching them taking them to a room back and forth and all that kind of stuff um you know compared with the skype call well you know it's kind of in terms of efficiency it's a no-brainer um and that's a, a real concern and i think particularly in the context also of coronavirus there was a study done um last month um, here, where um, prisons were described as it was, by, it was done by an epidemiolog epidemiologist, and it was uh, prisons were described as epidemiological pumps. And the point that the author was making is that kind of what what goes on in prison doesn't stay in prison. So if you kind of think about the British prison system or the England and Wales prison system, roughly speaking, about one and a half thousand prisoners or new prisoners in normal circumstances, go into prison every week, about one and a half thousand come out of prison every week. Um, those are 1,500 potential coronavirus carriers going in, one and a half thousand potential coronavirus carriers coming out. And that's before you even think, or even if you start thinking about, about families um, and children who quite understandably want to be able to hug mum or dad, not just kind of wave at them in a socially distanced manner. So I do think that, you know, this is a real problem. And whilst I absolutely applaud uh, the kind of sensitive uh, work that's being done to try to ensure that prisoners and their families can keep in touch with each other, we've got to be really, really careful that that doesn't become the new normal. And then suddenly family visits, um, kind of, oh, why would you want to actually physically go and visit someone in prison? Well, you, you can have your Skype call. 
And then, you know, I think the, the broader point, of course, is that we need to be doing as much as possible to uh, reduce the number of parents inside in the first place, not, not just kind of try and make it more livable for them when they're there. And certainly one of the things we've seen in, in the US is that about 70% of prisons and jails have video only contact. Um, and that's one of the reasons the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child recommended that it could never replace physical contact. But of course, the, the US hasn't um, signed up to the, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So it's, it does make it rather difficult. Um, so it is a real worry that that will become a replacement rather than an, an addition. And what I'd like to see is, is that it's an addition um, because it is a, it's great to have as many options as possible to, to maintain that, that contact or to establish that contact where people weren't able to visit before. Um, but it's how, I, how it's used. And I absolutely agree. But I think we also need to kind of, you know, take seriously how do we turn the tap off? Uh, you know, one of the reasons why I... I started with the, um, I should have explained that at the beginning actually, um, one of the reasons that I started with by looking at the youth justice system is because one of the strongest determinants of if you end up in prison as an adult is were you in prison as a child and a young person. You know, so if you were in prison as a child or young person, um, you're far more likely to end up in prison as an adult. So actually those young people who tragically lost their lives, many of the young people in custody, they are the they are the likely parent prisoners of the future. And you know, which is why I think that the addressing the issue about children's or parents of children in prison actually starts with how do we address the problem of children in prison? Because if we can tackle that, then we can have the potential over a generation of kind of breaking the link and reducing the recycle rate where you have children who have already been brutalized in prison then trying to make sense of their lives having children themselves and then going back into prison um, as adults and then of course there's children outside and there's also that's the other thing because a lot of children and young people in prison have had a background in care or a kind of very difficult parenting background so these things are all very connected and i think it's really important while we focus on tackling something specific like how can parents stay in touch with their kids and vice versa we also kind of think about how do these different bits of the system actually connect and create vicious cycles, but potentially also how can we change them to create virtuous cycles so that we are not in a generation's time talking about how can we ensure that parents stay in touch with their kids when they're in prison. Thank you. Um, my cat's decided to join us. As you see, she usually has dinner at five o'clock, so um, she's making her presence known. Um, hopefully it won't be too much of a problem, but we'll find out. Um, one question from um, Berlin, again from Freya Hilfe in Berlin, is um, asking about people who are in prison um, for pre-trial detention. Do they have the same option for contact um, with, with their families through video visits or whatever? In the, in the pilot of the project, they, they were not allowed to participate because of the security risks. Now, during this pandemic situation, they are allowed. And what will happen in the future, we will see. I don't know what are the plans of the Ministry of Justice, but I know this was the one category that was more, uh, the mostly vulnerable considering allowing them to engage in this kind of form of communication due to their uh, proceedings. Okay. Eduardo, in Italy, is that something that you can do? Yes, you know, when you are in a pre-trial prison, the judge has to tell if uh, the prisoner can or cannot make a telephone call or a video, a video call. Uh, in, it's completely different when the, 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 you have a prison with sentences, prisoners, you know? So they, are, they have the right to make the telephone calls and everything. So it's the director of the prison that decides. But in the pre-trial prisons, it's the judge that, that decides, not the director of the prison. So it's more difficult in a certain, in a, in a way. Right. Okay. Um, question from Giovanna Fanti um, for Merna. Can you see the reaction of children when they see photos of the prison's internal spaces? How do children react when they see a picture of inside the prison? Uh, no, we cannot because we are not there during visitations, but we get some positive feedback from the uh, prison officials. Uh, regarding the posters uh, and as a form of uh, new topics and discussions uh, during uh, the, the regular contacts. 
because sometimes it's uh, difficult for prisoners to reconnect with their children or to have maybe something to talk about. And this was, uh, this was a great uh, source of inspiration, especially considering the prisoner's life and their, their daily life activities. Thank you. I'm trying to race through this. I'm saying I've got another 53 questions to come through, so we're probably not going to have time to do all of those. Um, Alice Longe asks if there's a specific reason for um, children of imprisoned parents to be encouraged to chat and meet each other in prison spaces. Um, is it possible for families to choose whether they meet together or whether they meet privately? Is that something, um, I, think it's, um, I think it's aimed at Eduardo, but it could probably be for both of you. Yeah, of course, this is all uh, the private decision of each family and each prisoner, whether they want to engage in, uh, in direct contacts or whether they want to engage in uh, video visits. Uh, they have these um, uh, hours per month they can use on child visitations, and these video visits are extra hours. So this is a special service that they can use if they wish. Uh, the only thing is that they need to uh, fill the documentations and get approval, but uh, each individual decides for themselves whether they want to, uh, in what kind of communication they want to engage. Uh, Rhoda was strongly rec um, recommending that uh, they uh, keep the same uh, uh, opportunities for direct visits in order not to reduce them. We want to keep uh, video visits as a supplement and use it maybe during the week if child cannot visit directly because of uh, school and stuff like this and keep the direct contacts uh, we were advocating for longer hours during the weekends. Eduardo, is that something you have? Uh, they always decide. I, I mean, we are talking about before COVID-19 and then after COVID-19 because now they have only uh, they have the right of only one visit a month, only one visit a month. But we 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 pick up all these, you know, with the, the yellow phone, yellow telephone. We pick up only one phrase. We want to get, we want to go in. We want to go inside, and you know, we want hugs, and we don't want a video, uh, a screen. You know, they always they they they, they say. Just only this phrase, whenever they call. Um, another question actually from two people, from Tiziana and from um, the, some colleagues in Berlin. Is Bambini working across all prisons in, in Italy? And if so, how is that managed? Their experience in Germany was that every prison seems to be making it following their own rules. Um, and so if you have one program, how do you coordinate that across, in their case, 200 prisons? Okay, just give me one hour and I can explain you everything. But <laughs> I got the list here. We, we operate in Lombardy, Pedemont, Tuscany, Campania, Apulia, Calabria, Sicily, Veneto, Marche, Lazio, and so forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all around Italy. In some of the, pre, you know, the historic um, settlements, let's put it in this way, like uh, Milan, uh, Naples, Turin, uh, uh, Florence, uh, and so forth. We are personally, I mean, people of uh, Bambini and Sasbaris people are there. And also we are training, uh, you know, NGOs. Uh, we are tutoring them. And so they work with the yellow system, yellow system um, MOU. Do you understand what I mean? Just they have the rules, so that <laughs> we check them, we train them, and then uh, eventually they become our partner in other areas. By the way, we work through all Italy, all the 21 region, because, because we train already on behalf of the Minister of Justice, Italian Minister of Justice, we have been training the, all the directors, all the officers of all the 200, and 200 uh, prisons in Rome with special courses. And so literally we are, we are working all around Italy, in every, in every region, in every, in every prison. Whenever we do, you know perfectly, they don't know the, the match uh, uh, with that. The match with that is done by 80 prisons and every year increases the number. 
and is organized with the Minister of Justice, who is sending a, a kind of letter, official letter, about all these things. So we are working, in a, substantially, we are working with all the prisons. Thank you. I have a related question, which um, Richard, you might be able to help with this. And Eduardo, I know you can answer this question, but uh, Martin Dubois in Belgium is saying that, um, again, the management is, the prison management is left to decide on practical measures to, to help children maintain contact. Um, but what he's asking is whether anyone has had any experience or success in lobbying the government to provide clear guidance on prison management and impose um, clear minimum standards. Um, well, I mean, the work that we've done over some years with partners at the European Prison Observatory has been precisely aimed at, at kind of trying to do that, try to establish some kind of consistency at a European-wide level. It's in some cases, obviously, a fairly low bar, it has to be said, but it's about kind of trying to, you know, um, we don't necessarily talk about best practice, we talk about better practice. Um, so that is a kind of, there's an issue, I mean, actually in, in, in the UK, the prison systems are very centralised. So um, the issue that Martin was talking about in Belgium is unlikely to arise in the UK because it's kind of, you know, it's basically decided at a prison service headquarters level in most of these cases. So going back, for example, to the question about remand prisoners and family visits, in normal circumstances, a sentence prisoner gets a minimum of, or is supposed to get a minimum of two visits a month. Um, a remand prison is in, a prisoner is in theory meant to get up to three visits per week. Now, whether whether what's actually, and that's in England and Wales, I'm not sure about the situation in Scotland. Um, whether that is the case now with what's happening, you know, that actually remand prisoners are getting a lot more access to Skype or other kind of video calls or other kinds of forms of contact than sentenced prisoners, I somehow doubt, I have to say. I think that's probably unlikely. Um, but yeah, it's a kind of, um, we tended our work trying to sort of push standards of intensity European rather than at a, a UK level. Thanks. Uh, Eduardo, did you want to mention the, the MOU? Uh, yes, I want to mention also, I read here, the hug gloves. Marvellous idea, great idea, really. <laughs> I read on the chat. <laughs> I read on the chat. The more is uh, another hour of explanation. Anyway, we, we, we sign the kind of uh, rules, rules, they came from a, a European research done 10 years ago. And these rule, rules were uh, uh, being adopt, adopted by the Minister of, Ju of Justice. Together with us, the Minister of Justice and the Omdus woman and the Omdus person for adolescents uh, signed the first MOU the, the name, the right name is Charter of the Rights of the Children with Imprisoned Parents. This is the long, you know, the long name. And MOU is, it, it, it has been running for the last uh, six years, six years, and there are rules in a certain way. And they are admittedly uh, uh, adopted by the recommendation, the European, the, the, the Council of Europe's, of Europe recommendation. Uh, you can find all the rules, the Italian rules there. And we know, we understand even in Croatia, um, I understand in, in, in Netherlands and other countries, they are lobbying with their governments to obtain about the same thing. At the very beginning was the only, country in the world. We, we, we had visits from Turkey, from Argentina, from many countries, uh, even outside Europe, to understand what is this. Anyway, we find, you find the, the Italian version, the English version, version, and the French version on our website, www.bambinisensosbare.org, and you, you, you can read all these articles are saying the things that we are saying now. Exactly the same. A little bit more because it, there are aims that has has to be issues that have have to be reached yet. But most of them we apply most of them in our yellow spaces in our yellow system uh, uh, because we, we, for example we are 
we are at the national table monitoring table for the MOU, which is a table that quarterly meet together with a lot of figures, data, and say, this is going wrong, this is going good, this is, must be improved, we check this, it doesn't work, and so forth. So it's a very uh, exchanging uh, uh, data table. It's uh, a dynamic tool, I suppose. Yeah, something that's absolutely. absolutely. It's so, of course, it's, uh, it, it needs a lot of work. Absolutely, yeah. But it is a very positive example. I think COPE has the Italian memorandum on its website, I think, as an example. Yeah, it has, absolutely. Yeah. I guess also it has in English and French. Ask yeah. yeah, something that has been tried, but... I think it's, 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 it's like this. Yeah. yeah. We can certainly make sure that people would like a copy. It's either on the COPE website or um, we can, if you contact COPE, we can make sure it reaches to you. Um, just to say, following up from that, there all the links and the slides and things from today will be available um, to you after the after the, the end of the event. A um, couple of statistical questions. Richard, are there any statistics for Turkey? And also, is any data available about um, COVID-19 infections and deaths? Um, and are they updated? Um, well, on that second one, and just talking about um, the, the UK, um, in England and Wales, there is a daily update that is produced on the numbers of prisoners tested, the numbers of prisons with confirmed positive cases, and likewise, number of prison staff and prison. Um, but it's not broken down by individual prison. Um, so that information must be available. I mean, you know, it's a kind of a, a governmental level, uh, but they don't release it into the, um, into the public domain. Mm -hmm. um, and because of the, um, one of the casualties of coronavirus has been the um, freedom of information system. So it's much more difficult now to get the information out of government. Um, Scotland is being, my sense is the data in Scotland and Northern Ireland is not quite as comprehensive as England and Wales, but the fact of England and Wales data isn't particularly comprehensive anyway. Um, as for Turkey, we don't, we haven't, we haven't looked at Turkey um, as a, um, as, as, a, as a country to, to look at, largely because we don't have a Turkish-based partner who we can liaise with uh, to collate the data. So, um, if um, if so, was Ebru? Did you say? Um, if if Ebru, sorry, I'm sorry if I've mispronounced your name as well. Um, if if Ebru knows of an organisation that might be interested in, in collaborating with us on, on on the situation in Turkey, we'd certainly love to hear about it. But and you know what's happening at a Turkish government level, whether they're collating the data in any meaningful sense, I, I simply don't know. That's great, thank you. Um, I'm very conscious we've got about 15 minutes left if we stretch it to the very end and I've got 64 messages that I haven't even looked at yet, um, <laughs> but we'll get there. Um, colleagues from Canada suggesting that people put their suggestions for positive practice on the chat, which is great, a lot of really good stuff coming up there. Um, Michelle is asking about um, countries increasing the number of phone calls. Um, in, in Scotland, does it ask, uh, we have, for example, uh, a certain number of, of phone, a certain amount of phone credit, telephone credit being added to prisoners' accounts so that we have some free telephone calls. Um, mobile phones have been promised for a very, very long time. They're still not in place yet. And every time we ask the Scottish Prison Service, they say they're coming soon. Um, but nothing else. That, one of the problems we have in Scotland is there was legislation blocking um, the use of mobile phones in prisons, so that legislation has to be overturned, um, whereas there hasn't been any specific legislation in relation to video visits, so we're likely to see those in place before we see the mobile phones in place. But are there other countries that um, uh, have increased the number of telephone calls or, or use of mobile phones, for example? Is that something that uh, any of you have come across? Well, in, I mean, in France, I know that they've um, they've introduced, basically given every prisoner a um, a phone card with a, a certain kind of limit on the number of euro they can spend on phone calls each week but on the face of it it seems relatively generous. Um, in England and Wales they've been introducing mobile phones into prisons uh, you know particularly kind of controlled mobile phones but we're talking about you know one or two per prison so on average uh, so it's kind of a bit pathetic really in terms of uh, you know trying to kind of foster any uh, any meaningful contact uh, with, with families if you're going to base it on that. 
Merida and Eduardo, is that something that you've introduced, Eduardo? Uh, <clears throat> a big uh, company, I don't say I don't say the name, the biggest one in Italy, have uh, presented uh, uh, a lot, I don't know how many, but you know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, mobile phones for, you know, for WhatsApp video chat to the prisoners, I mean, to the prisons, and then they give, uh, uh, they give them to the prisoners. You know? Uh, the prison system in Croatia uh, allowed more intensified telephone contacts uh, for all the prisoners due to the suspension of direct visits and also uh, they uh, left this opportunity for people who cannot afford themselves a telephone calls if they have uh, uh, reasonable justification that then the prison itself will finance the calls with the family. So uh, they uh, reported us that they have more intensive um, uh, telephone calls and it's also um, most of the prisoners uh, use this opportunity to have uh, more time for, for calls. Thank you. Um, we've discussed this briefly um, previously in relation to support for people who might struggle with, with video access or telephone access, but specific question from Lucy Gamble again, it talks about um, is whether there's support for children or any problems with children being excluded from um, video visits, particularly, um, for example, Roma children and families. Has that been a problem? Well, we were, um, while, well, when we were preparing activities for this project, we were actually uh, expecting something like this. Uh, but I was very positively surprised that uh, we didn't encounter this. Even people who were really struggling with poverty, they had a mobile and they uh, had an internet access. Uh, we were having these agreements with uh, of, uh, prison officials that if somebody doesn't have internet access or mobile or any other devices, that we will find some local NGO if it's outside of Zagreb or that we will start a, a cooperation with social wef welfare but we did not have any appeal uh, until now. Everybody were able, who were interested to participate in video visits, they had internet and uh, any of devices. Okay, thank you. Eduardo, did you want to come in on that one? Yeah, for the Roma, we are building up a project with a partner of ours in, in Italy, just for this problem, because the problem is digital divide. In this case, it's economical digital divide. I don't have the money to pay the connection. I don't have the money to, to buy a smartphone, which is a huge problem, not only for the prisoners. It's a huge problem all around the world. You know, the poor people that have less connection than rich, the rich one. Poor connected, rich connected. This is the difference. Um, quick question for Eduardo from Sarah T is asking about whether the yellow phone is also uh, being used for children who are in prison with their mothers in Italy. Nope. Nope. That was a quick question. Okay. <laughs> is that something that could be introduced? Is it, yeah, yeah. Of course, there are about 50 now, 50 in Italy. You know, the number is going up and down, 30, 35, 40, and then sometimes more, sometimes less. The number is there. Of course, we, we always say, uh, as also all the members of COPE, all the organizations are saying the same thing. Children should not be in a prison. That's it. Stop it. <laughs> Nothing more to say. Excellent. Okay, we're getting some really good suggestions for positive practice coming through on the chat, so do have a look at that. Um, one question from Sarah Birch is asking about whether some countries are reluctant to introduce video visits, and um, if so, why, and how can pressure be put um, to, uh, in, to, in, to implement video visits? That's for any of you. Uh, well, I think uh, most of the countries will have this uh, ideological question whether it's safe, whether it, it will endanger anybody. In Croatia, that was also a struggle because uh, Roda started to advocate for video visits uh, with 2015 and also with a strong support of Ombudsman for Children. They were also advocating it. But uh, we needed to wait until the special moment and the opportunities to brought this on, on a higher level in order to put it as a, as a norm. 
it was involving international partners, somebody like UNICEF was, I think, the crucial part in the whole process. Okay, thank you. Um, one question for all of you, it's a bigger question. What would be one lesson from the pandemic which could usefully be taken forward for the new normal? This is from Kate Philbrick on the board at COPE. What one lesson from the pandemic which could usefully be taken forward as the new normal? Richard, shall I start with you? That's, um, that's such a good question, Kate, because um, there are so many potential lessons. Um, I mean, I think, I suppose there's a difference between what's, what's kind of more likely and what one might aspire to. So I think what's more likely um, is that the lesson taken from this will be the prison agents. The prison um, service will find ways of muddling through and managing um, whether that's in relation to family visits or more broadly in terms of prisoner welfare. Um, if they can um, at least um, kind of keep a lid on numbers um, and they've, they've reduced the numbers a bit, mostly because the courts aren't sitting, then that might help. The courts shut works wonders. <laughs> oh, well, exactly, exactly. I mean, you know, who, who defunk it? Yeah. Um, so that's the kind of, in a sense, the pessimistic thing. And that's not necessarily awful because actually some good things might come from that. Um, you know, my kind of what I think the lesson needs to be is that you know prisons if you're faced with a pandemic situation prisons are rather like care homes uh, you know or hospitals and other things where there's been a lot of debate about the degree to which you can catch infection when you're in um, they're just not safe and healthy places to try to contain a pandemic and you know going back to that point about um, ep epidemiological pumps every person in prison is a risk of coronavirus infection in the wider community. So if we are serious about wanting to get a lid on coronavirus, not just in the short term, but you know, over the next, let's say three to five years, uh, which you know, some are suggesting is a realistic um, frame for um, um, you know, maybe developing a, a vaccine, if one can be developed, um, then we just have to have for far fewer people in prison. You know, and that could start with sentencing reform. We could just change sentencing, sentencing so you just don't send people to prison for short periods of time, for example, you know, two weeks, two months, six months, a year, you know, because they're just in and out. We could think about remand. Um, yeah, and that would have a huge benefit on, on, on many children's of, children of potential prisoners because there's lots of people cycling in and out of the prison system. So you could start with, uh, with sentencing reform. We could then think about what happens when people are coming out of prison uh, in relation to um, you know, ongoing supervision and support, tackling issues around homelessness, drug addiction. You know. So there's a lot of things. You know, the prisons kind of tend to just kind of accumulate um, lots of kinds of broader problems in society. Um, so I think there's an opportunity there, and that would be, I suppose, the broad lesson, you know, kind of fundamental social reform. Um, whether that's likely uh, will probably depend in part on, you know, which countries you're talking about, what kind of governments you're talking about, with what kind of governing logic and philosophy. Eduardo, you wanted to come in? Yes, I don't want a, I don't want a new normal normality. Uh, my option is a new normal disruption so a lot less prison well, some uh, some scholars here in italy have calculated see in italy we have 58000 people in prison and 61000 people with alternative uh, measures at home and so forth and some people some experts calculated that in italy we should have no more than 8,000 people in prison. 8,000 people in prison, eight. And actually, but now we have more than 100 people sentencing, you know? Okay, serving their sentence. So now we want to be, um, we want a revolution, you know, sometimes, it, we had a revolution. This COVID, it's a kind of absolute, um, uh, absolute um, disruption, total disruption of every, every kind, of every aspect of our life. So that's just get into the stream, the new boost, uh, and really think, change the things. I don't want the new normal. I want the new normal revolution. Otherwise, 
otherwise we 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 just you know the the real danger everybody is saying the same about the prison the real danger that is that covid 19 passes away and that's it and everything is just the same as before no no this shouldn't happen excellent Myrna, anything what would be the one thing that you would take forward i think it's always very important to uh, be open for uh, new initiatives and be creative because sometimes there are little things and uh, and strategies that can really improve the the lives of individuals and i'm not talking just about the prison system but in general this is very chaotic uh, situation that was unexpected and, and changed our lives and uh, i think i personally learned that uh, you should always use the time for the best and appreciate little moments but i think yeah probably it will be a uh, um, inspiration for some new alternatives way of communicating and and uh, empowering prisoners and, and children to stay together and i think we all should be open for a cooperation and these kind of new initiatives that will be that will rise that's great and i'm seeing i was noticing that most of those questions almost all of them in fact that were left on on the chat were all examples of practice that have been um, introduced are really positive things that people can um, introduce in their own jurisdictions and learn from each other um, which is hugely helpful i should say that um, cope is now um, putting out newsletters monthly and if you have suggestions like that and brianna i don't know if we'll be able to hang on to the chat after um the webinar finishes but um anything like that would be enormously helpful to include in the in the cope newsletter specifically so we can learn from each other about what's possible and whether it's hug gloves or whether it's um zoom chats or whether it's um you know ways of lobbying um, governments to ensure some sort of of change and, and consistency so that would be really really helpful again the um you can contact cope which brianna has shared the contact information uh, at the beginning of the chat um we've had a couple of requests for repeating the webinar or doing something similar so if you have enjoyed the event again please do consider joining cope as an affiliate signing up for the cope newsletter cope is running a further online event in june um, again with the opportunity for um, presentations and, and group discussions so if you'd like to to join in for those um that's in, in instead of its normal annual network meeting which was due to take place in Leiden. Um, we're doing an online event again, so there will be another opportunity. So please do um, sign up to, to join us for that as well. Um, we only have two minutes left, so I'm going to leave it there, I think, and just say thank you so much for all of you for joining in. I know it was a bit of a challenge for some of you with the language and with the technology and all sorts of things. So we're just really pleased to see this level of enthusiasm and engagement and uh, thanks especially to the speakers uh, to all three of you for taking the time and sharing your, your thoughts and, and um, really rich um, presentations and, and discussions I'm really really grateful for that um, so hopefully we'll see you at the the meeting in in June and um, thanks very very much to all of you and stay safe